great, Hugh. At least we're not freezing down here in Florida like everybody else seems to be. I know, poor, poor old Texas. Uh, they are really getting slammed. Admiral, I want to play for you. Uh, in October of 2019, the People's Republic of China had a big military parade, and I found the audio from a report in The Telegraph, which leads me to my next story. So let me play the audio for the benefit of our audience. Roll it, gentlemen. China has showed off some of the most advanced weaponry in the world with a huge military parade in Beijing. In a full display of power for its rivals, they've unveiled a new range of high-tech military weapons for the very first time. One of those is this intercontinental ballistic missile. It can carry up to 10 nuclear warheads and can reach the United States in as little as 30 minutes. With a range of 9,000 miles, it can fly further than any other nuclear missile in the world. Overhead, a new strategic bomber designed to project power far into the Pacific Ocean and China's first stealth jet fighters. But the showstoppers were the weapons of the future. There was the Sharp Sword combat drone, an unmanned aerial combat vehicle that could make piloted strike fighters obsolete. This supersonic reconnaissance drone designed to locate American aircraft carriers far out in the Pacific Ocean. And a hypersonic missile a sleek dart that flies at more than five times the speed of sound, so fast it can penetrate all existing missile defenses used by the West. So, Admiral, that is very scary. That's the offensive capability, and this morning's Financial Times has a headline, China targets rare earth exports curbs to hobble U.S. defense industry. They make 80% of the global supply of 17 rare earth minerals, we use them in the production of F-35. So they're producing offensive capability, and now they're going after our capability. Your conclusion? Um, you haven't even mentioned or shown the most dangerous thing of all. It's invisible, and it's cyber. It's the ability to use electrons, if you will, to attack our electric grid, our transportation systems, our water supplies. We saw probably in a hacker go after a water supply down in Florida, but it's indicative of vulnerability. So uh, yes, on a, a lot of very high tech, very dangerous offensive military hardware. Yes, on let's call it geoeconomic power, controlling rare earths, building networks of uh, like-minded nations working together. They've signed an economic deal with Iran. So geoeconomics plus the hardware and to me, the most concerning thing is actually the software. It's the uh, cyber offensive capability. So, yes, a formidable opponent. Now, we're about the same age. So we will remember the Time magazines that used to come out with the correlation of forces with the Soviet Union. They would show the little guys who stood for battalions and they would have the tank column. And we were always behind until you got to the nuclear weapon. And that was a way that the Americans were aware of the arms race. They, and they were in Newsweek, Time, and U.S. News and World Report, which is the only way that most middle-class American families actually got anything beyond the nightly news. Does the American public have any idea of the correlation of forces that exist now between the PRC and the United States, including cyber? I think there is a, a sort of a dawning awareness of it. And I base that, like you, Hugh, I do a lot of speaking around the country, currently all virtual. But I base it on the uh, the questions I get, which are reasonably sophisticated, uh, look hard at those kinds of concerns that we ought to have. I think there's a, a dawning awareness. Hey, if you want to think about from, you know, the 60s and 70s when we were kids, the other thing is the box game called Risk, right? This is a game where you built a coalition of nations. You kind of work to get allies. You work to surround your opponents because geography has an immutable quality to it. The point of the game of risk is build up your alliances. I think that's the best prescription as we deal with this increasing juggernaut coming from China. Get the Europeans with us. Build up the Japanese military capability, the Australians, the South Koreans, the Singaporeans create coalitions that are credible. That's what creates deterrence. That's the only thing, in my view, that's really going to slow down China. Now, Admiral, coming up after you is Congressman Michael Waltz, Green Beret out of Florida. He may, in fact, represent you in Florida. I'm not sure if his district gets up to Jacksonville. Maybe he's a little bit to your south. He has Daytona Beach. 
And yesterday, and my son works for him, so I always disclose that too. Yesterday, he introduced a resolution in the Congress to boycott the 2022 Chinese Olympics on the basis of, among other things, the genocide underway that uh, Secretary of State Blinken agreed with former Secretary of State Pompeo was underway, uh, the Hong Kong repression, the threats to Taiwan. What's your reaction to that proposal? Um, I think it is an open question. And here's how I would go at it. First of all, let's look at the history of boycotts. Last time we did that, we, the U.S., boycotted the Olympics over the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. At the end of the day, it didn't change policy one iota. It penalized our athletes. Um, we didn't build that coalition and work together. So I think it's premature, certainly, to talk about a boycott. What ought to make more sense is a quiet conversation, very broadly among the democracies, uh, about whether China ought to be hosting the games, uh, given the fact that they are running concentration camps with up to a million Uyghurs, the human rights violations that are frequently on display. I would rather at this stage see a conversation about um, whether it still makes sense to allow China to even host the games. That would open the path for the IOC to walk it back, choose a new location. I think that... Uh, doesn't penalize our side, if you will, but it penalizes China appropriately. So now the, we, let me close with one other thought. There's still time for China to change behavior here. So uh, if part of what the congressman is proposing, by the way, he's not my congressman. I have a, a different one, a little bit north, as you mentioned, but I, I know him and follow him. Um, I think that it, it would be a better thing to do to start those conversations uh, without defining exactly what we're going to do, create some uncertainty in the mind of China. That might change their behavior. Now, I'll ask him about that afterwards. But the chicken and the egg, we, Senator Rick Scott, who is your senator, introduced a move the Olympics, and it got no traction. So waltz up the ante, I think, and I'll find out from him after the break, in order to bring leverage to bear on the IOC. Now, the IOC actually moved the Japan Olympics back a year because of the virus. So they have the ability to do that. They could also move the Winter Olympics back a year and they actually then allow for some separation between winter and summer games and get to Salt Lake City or get to a European neutral, get to Switzerland someplace to hold the games. That isn't the PRC. That is the best thing to do. And then China would be upset with the world, but they'd be upset with the world upon whom they visited this pandemic. Do you think there's any way the IOC does that without the United States leading with a boycott? Um, I think there's little chance the IOC would do it without not only the United States, but a concerted strategy that brought together uh, the United States, the NATO team, um, our democratic allies. I think it's a big, complicated diplomatic question. I'm certain that the, the Biden administration will explore that. Let's face it, they have been more vocal uh, and anti-China concerning human rights than anything else, and that's your best hook to get other nations involved in this. So um, I, I'm, I think it's important that we look at all the options, and I commend the congressman for uh, surfacing the conversation in the halls of Congress and, and Senator Scott as well. Um, but I'm more build an alliance uh, and try and get the IOC to move than I am simply announcing the U.S. is going to boycott the games. That could leave us hanging out there roughly as it did in, in 1980. La last question. Does boycott help amplify what I began on? Awareness of military parades, rare earth boycotts, cyber threats? Because again, I'm, I'm a little less optimistic than you are about whether or not Americans are as aware as they were in the 50s and 60s of the Soviet threat. I think it does. And um, uh, conversations about prosaic things that actually impact Americans tend to get Americans' attention. So um, what about uh, prices of goods, uh, prices of raw materials, the Olympics, as you mentioned? Um, the uh, availability of products coming here, suddenly our prices go up. All those things, I think, have a tendency to focus the mind on potential opponents like China. Certainly, this will be, the, the Olympic issue will be an interesting one where 
the Republicans who are strongly, if you will, anti-China kind of meet the Democrats who are strongly pro-human rights. It could be a bridging issue. Uh, and I think that would get some traction with the American public across that political spectrum, Hugh. Admiral James Stavridis, you can find him through Washington Speakers Bureau or at stavridis.com. Is it Admiral Stav or is it stavridis.com, Admiral? AdmiralStav.com. 